It's good to know you're still with us. We're still talking about how Africa can change the narrative and be the you know, miracle for the world's economy. Um, I have uh, my second guest for this conversation, and that's uh, Trevo Luere, uh, research analyst, development reimagined. Thank you very much for joining us all the way from Kampala. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes, indeed. I, I don't know if you followed my conversation with Olusheun, um, but I, I want to start I from... Okay, you did, right? So let's start from the beginning. Know. Your perception of this research uh, by the chair of Rockefeller Foundation. Um, do you agree with his submission? Is Africa the biggest problem for the world economy? Well, we, we must put uh, his submissions in proper context for us to be able to then make a valid judgment on whether or not indeed what he meant was uh, what we're interpreting it to be. Uh, from where I sit, there seems to be some anxiety in the developing world about the diminishing sources of growth in those economies. And so the pivot then to Africa as the last bastion of economic growth for the world economy must be understood from that perspective. So the moniker of Africa being the world economy's biggest challenge mustn't be interpreted as an indication that we uh, are weighing down the world's economy, but from the perspective, really a self-interested perspective of the industrialized societies who think that given the circumstances they're facing, as, uh, such as you know demographic changes with aging populations, given those challenges, where else can they tap into to, con to drive continuous economic growth? So it, it's important to put it in perspective. I do not think his argument is that uh, Africa uh, is a drag on the world economy, but from a self-interested pers self perspective of developing of developed or industrialized societies, uh, that the last bastion for economic growth. Is, is Africa. Uh, uh, Trevor, it, 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 is, it doesn't it matter with framing? Because the whole, from a layman's perspective, when you read the entire piece, at the bottom he says that the population is not being properly utilized and leadership is also an issue. For me, these were the two key things that came out of that piece. So if you look at it from that angle, wouldn't it, would it be so out of place to... Um, look at it from the perspective that he is actually, you know, literally correct when he says Africa is the biggest problem uh, for the world's economy. We have a population we're not maximizing its use. We have leaders who are self-centered, who are not exploring manufacturing as the other um, East Asian um, nations have done. So if you take it in, you, I know you're looking at it from a scholarly angle, but look at it from the ordinary man's perspective and maybe analyze it from there and let us see how do we need to work to address the challenge so that people like Shama can reframe the argument and say, okay, Africa needs to up its game other than saying we are the problem. Right. Well, uh, my, my opening remarks were important because we must put this we must ask ourselves, why is he saying it at this particular time? Because all the challenges he highlights are not new to Africa either. It's not as though uh, it's only now in 2023 that we are becoming aware of the existence of those challenges. So they have been existent, and uh, African countries and African governments have made effort to try and resolve these challenges. But it was important to give that context because it helps us understand why such comments are being made at this particular point in time. But I do agree with you that uh, he points to real existing challenges within uh, uh, at the African continent. And uh, to that extent, I, I, I agree that we have a challenge of uh, the so-called demographic dividend that has been severally referred to, that we don't seem to be well positioned to harness because of the absence of many ingredients that would be necessary for us to take advantage of, uh, of, 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 of that factor. And so to that extent, yes, I do agree that he's pointing to, to uh, a real existent material objective condition in society that we must do something about. But the point he makes about leadership as well is also uh, to an extent true, that uh, 
Leadership is a resource that Africa can make much more use of in trying to transform our societies and our economies from their current state to where we desire them to be. Now, I, I, I'm sure that in a, the course of our conversation, we shall get into some of the, uh, of the ways that he describes some of those things. His references to questions of corruption, our underutilization of young people, and his own assessment of why those things are the way that, that, that they are. Uh, I can get into those comments now. I don't know if you want to take the conversation to a different direction. No, no, I think you should drive the narrative because what we are looking at on one slot is the way we can move forward. We've established that these are existing issues. So if you were to take this research and dissect it um, yourself from a productive angle, just ride with it. Yeah. How would you go about it? All right. No, thank you. So uh, the charge that the author puts across for African countries is that we are underinvesting to be able to take advantage of the demographic dividend that we find ourselves with today. And he attributes that to the question of, of leadership. Now, we must ask ourselves, how do we find ourselves in a situation where we are unable to make the necessary investments in uh, capitalizing on the many factors that we have working in our favor, including natural resources, including uh, a demographic dividend. Now, from my perspective, there's both internal and external factors. And uh, I'll get to the discussion of the internal factors, which, of course, include the question of leadership. But to start with the external factors, the development model that we chose makes us, to a very large extent, dependent on external actors. Because economic growth is basically increase in, out, in economic output. How do we increase the volume of goods that we are producing in an economy, in this case, the African economy. To do that, we must have sufficient amounts of capital and technology. And capital, in this case, we're thinking of it in terms of investment funds that are going to go to make the sorts of investments that are necessary to increase productivity uh, within the African economy. Now, our presidents all across the continent spend much of their time running around the world asking uh, private investors and official lenders to give us money to be able to invest in our, in our economies. So we must then ask ourselves the question, why have other parts of the world been in a position to both ask for and receive the amounts of money that they have requested, whereas we, on the other hand, have only received a paltry sum? Uh, as a matter of fact, Africa only receives about 5% of global FDI inflows, while uh, Asia, for example, enjoys over 30%, and the West enjoys uh, over 40% of global FDI flows. Why is it the case that Africa is receiving less investment? I'd you know, like you to answer that question before you proceed, because one thing is to answer that question, why is Africa not getting uh, that? And what, in your view, are we not doing that we should be doing in order for us to get those? Yes, I was getting right into that. Now, internally, of course, some uh, factors to which this has been attributed have been things like, the absence of a stable political environment in many African countries. There's been a, a lack of infrastructure investment that is going to attract investment. Uh, others have pointed to a lack of functional institutions that will make sure that the market economy is functioning as it should. Whereas there's truth to some of those, all those sum to what we at Development Reimagined refer to as a risk premium uh, on the African continent. In other words, in the minds of investors, both of both public and private investors, Africa is a risky place to invest. Even when there have been studies that have pointed to the fact that if you invest in Africa, you're going to get a higher return on investment than any other part of the world, still money hasn't come to the African continent because there is a risk premium. And some of the places where this risk premium is getting enforced is through the World Bank and the IMF's debt sustainability analysis framework, which, despite Africa having a projected faster rate of economic growth uh, than the rest of the world, most of the African countries uh, have featured on the, on the World Bank's list of countries that are in debt distress. So the mismatch between the growth trajectories of African countries and the assessments we receive with respect to debt from the international financial institutions do not help our case insofar as they reinforce the narrative that Africa is a risky place to invest. That is number one. Number two, there is an idea called co-evolutionary pragmatism uh, by one scholar in China, which basically means that development is not a, a, a process where you can put emphasis on a single factor and expect everything else to fall in place. So for instance, even if we invested, we, we close the infrastructure investment gap we have in Africa that has been estimated at about 170 billion per annum, 
we wouldn't be able to have industrialization if there isn't. Let, let, but Trevor, uh, sorry, let, let me butt in here. Um, you said yes. there is no, if I got you correctly, there is no one um, way to fix everything. But at the heart of the research that we are looking at is the question of leadership. Don't you feel yes. that if we can get that right, there is another question I, I really want to ask you, but uh, this one came out now. If we can yes. get that right, we've gotten about 80% of the problem addressed. Don't you think? No, no, I, I disagree. And this is the point that I've been trying to, to drive home, that whereas the internal factors that have been emphasized by others are important, including the question of leadership, we have chosen a development model that makes us dependent pretty much on the mercy of others. And to the extent that in the minds of those on whom we are dependent for capital and technology to drive the structural transformation of our economies, to the extent that we are dependent on those people and in their minds we are a risky place to invest, it is up to them to determine whether we are fit to receive the amounts of money we are requesting for uh, uh, in the urgency we need it and in the sums in which we need it. But coming to the question of leadership, the author in the article that you reference makes a comparison between East Asia during its development, uh, its phase of hyper intensive development, and African countries, arguing that so called big men in Asia were able to drive and put in place uh, the factors that drive growth, especially infrastructure, whereas in Africa, the focus is on perpetuating themselves in power. But this is why economists often get it wrong. They fail to account for the role of politics in economics because. Even if it's true that we struggle with the problem of corruption, China, that is the world's second largest economy today, is still struggling with a very robust anti-corruption uh, campaign. And so that, that factor of corruption, even when we look historically at East Asian countries, South Korea in particular, uh, Taiwan in particular, during their phase of hyper-intensive economic growth, were dogged very, very seriously with the problem of corruption. So a very high premium is put on the challenge of corruption and leadership in general, but it explains not the majority of the, of the problems uh, that we face. So that's not to say that is not important, but to say that those countries grew not because of, but despite of the existence of corruption in those places. So fixing the leadership problem, when the bigger part, which is the technology and capital investments that are necessary for structural transformation are not forthcoming, will leave us in the same place. I, 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 might not, I might not have the background knowledge that you have, but I really, from the, the perspective of from where I'm looking at it, I really beg to defer, really. Because if, if, if we get that right, half of our problem, mm -hmm. even choosing the development uh, um, uh, uh, pattern to take or the risk factors and all of that, will be reduced uh, to the barest minimum. We have very limited time, so I want to move the conversation uh, to the demographic concern that Shama raised, and that's our population. He says it's our strength and our weakness. And I want to come from a very ordinary um, uh, perspective from the fact that whether we like it or not, the population we grow. And we need to feed, we need to keep this population nourished. How important is it that we must get it right? Paint us, um, if you can, the worst case scenario of a population that is underutilized and the impact it will have, not for the world now, for Africa yeah. on its own? Yeah. No. Well, very important question. And the straightforward answer is that it's absolutely important that we get that question right. And here I want to harken back to the point that we've disagreed on previously, which is the question of leadership. So to the extent that our leadership in the face of the challenges we face hasn't been astute, sufficiently astute to devise means to get us out of uh, uh, the, the state in which we find ourselves in, they are culpable. But I'm saying that for most of us, we agree with the path that, that they have chosen. And so to that extent, we can only blame them insofar as we, we are thinking of a different uh, development path that we think should be pursued. So it's important, and our leaders must think of, if up to the present day, since we got independence, we pursued a particular path, and the desired results haven't come back, and now we're faced with a youth bulge that we don't seem to be clear on how we are going to capitalize on it. If the methods we've been deploying haven't worked thus far, we must engage our minds to think of new ways to go about the question of transforming the African economy. If we don't do that, getting to the point of what the worst case scenario could be, 
I think we're already starting to see what some of the challenges across the continent could be. When you have young people becoming despondent, that is losing faith in the possibility of their societies delivering for them, you're going to have a collapse of our societies insofar as young people are withdrawing their faith in our societies as functional entities. They're going to desire to go abroad and they're going to lose a, a critical mass of labor and consumers that would have driven economic growth on the continent. In worst case scenarios, this despondency is going to push them to engage in a, a rebellious and subversive activities such as uh, criminality, terror, that will undermine the functionality of our societies uh, uh, in the long term. But at the same time, it is going to make a, a society very difficult for us to govern. Because when you have hungry people who are unemployed, who are also not very hopeful about the prospects that the future holds for them, they are likely to turn on society itself to try and find ways of making a, a living for themselves by all means possible. So the so-called ticking time bomb that many have referred to in the past is not merely a, a rhetorical device that is deployed, but we've seen in many parts of the continent uh, where young people have been driven to take extreme measures because they've become despondent, they have lost faith. Every week, every passing month, you read about young people who, will lo who lose their lives trying to cross the Mediterranean to get to Europe. Uh, so all these challenges uh, that are going to make our young people despondent will likely undermine the possibility that societies can function, uh, can, can, can exist as functional entities, in, best, in which, in other words, means Africa, as we know it, uh, stands at a risk if we don't put our, our young people to productive right. employment, gain productive employment. Uh, the, the question I'm about to ask you, I framed uh, differently with uh, Olisha when I talked about what policymakers should take away, but... Um, for you, I want you to uh, um, move a little and talk about what you believe are some of the key takeaways from Shama's research that we must, I don't know why that word keeps coming to my head, imperative that we take from that research and run with it. Spend your time on it, please. Right. So what are the existing opportunities? So basically, both question, the question of leadership and capitalizing on, on, on the youth bulge are important questions. Uh, in terms of the question on leadership, it is important that we spend time studying how our approach has played out so far and why it hasn't worked out, and then figuring out how can we do things differently. And this is part of what inspires us at development reimagined, trying to reimagine development, asking ourselves what has been done before and what ought to be done differently. So African leaders at all levels must take the question of the historical study of the historical trajectory of Africa's development very, very seriously for us to be able to pick lessons from that and be able to devise new strategies to engage for the future. And part of that, obviously, as I've mentioned before, is the question of what do we do with our young people. Now, some of the opportunities that have emerged at this particular historical juncture is the transition, the green energy transition that we are witnessing. As you know, we are a reservoir for what some have called natural capital. At the moment, we imagine we recently released a report titled uh, Environmental Goods. How can Africa tap into that potential? How can we unleash the continent's potential in environmental goods? Basically, take advantage of the natural resources that we have uh, and the world's transition away from fossil fuels to see how that can power Africa's uh, economic transformation. And when we to do that, one of the recommendations that come out of our work is that we must take seriously the question of uh, economic integration across the continent, as well as regional cooperation. This is important because the model I referred to initially that we have chosen, the model of economic growth we've chosen, basically turns all of us into competitors. The pitch that Uganda is making for FDI is similar to the pitch that Kenya is making, is similar to the pitch that Rwanda is making all right, uh, uh, Trevor, I, I'm told we have uh, less than two minutes. So I know I told you to take oh. your time, but just wrap up in 40 seconds if you oh. can. Thank you. So to wrap it up, the question of economic integration and regional cooperation is going to be absolutely critical because it's going to give us strategic advantages where we're not negotiating as singular states whose bargaining power is significantly diminished vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, but where we have a increased bargaining power as combined as collectives within regions of the continent and the continent as a whole to be able to say, okay, what standards do we want to set in our interaction with the rest of the world when it comes to investment, to labor practices, to sustainability. So economic integration, 
as has been uh, uh, pushed through by, with the African continental free trade area and regional economic blocks is, a, is a, an incredible opportunity for us to take advantage of this historic opportunity that is the green transition out of fossil fuels. We're starting to see some of this happening in some parts of the world, in some parts of the continent, and even at the continental level. Okay. The, African, the African Union has the, the PDAP program that lists projects, infrastructure projects, that can power a transformation, economic transformation across the continent. And okay. finally, uh, some countries on the continent, Zimbabwe and Uganda in particular, have legislated against the export of the uh, unprocessed raw materials. If we take some of these measures and uh, capitalize on our collective strength, we can increase our bargaining power with the rest of the world significantly and take advantage of this strategic historic opportunity of the transition uh, to create many, many jobs for our young people and uh, transform our economies from the current Bravo. state in which they are. It's Thank been you. an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for the work you do and for giving us your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure as well. Both my guests agree. Our population, while being our strength, is also one of our biggest challenges. We must leverage not just this population, but technology and our expertise and address the perennial question of leadership. Otherwise, we might not be that miracle that the world economy takes. Thank you very much for being part of One Slot. We'll be back next week. Do take care. <laughs>